Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the fifth in our series of leadership programs. Today, we're concentrating on revenue management, profitability, and subjects and topics uh, around that. Our guests today are Ms. Shazeen Contractor from TFE Hotels, who is the Director of Sales and Distribution, and Mr. Harold Kopelwitz, who's a part owner of several hotels with his company, and he's going to explain all that to you later on. And he has several uh, hotel brands that, that run their companies. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is ask Shazeen to introduce herself. If you'd, and Shazeen is a uh, graduate of the school, and you left in? 2000. 2000. And Long time ago. <laughs> incidentally, <laughs> also married to a graduate, but that's, another, that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> And stayed in the room next door to Mr. Cook as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Too much information. Yes. <laughs> he was watching me, keeping an eye out. <laughs> so if you could just take us, you know, when you, when you finished at the school and what, what you did, you were in America, and, and just take us through your career and those sorts of things. Um, I spent three years uh, at Blue Mountains. I was one of the first set of students to do the degree up at the Blue Mountains, and that was at the Lura campus. Um, Sydney wasn't open yet at that time. Um, it was a great three years most wonderful experience. I worked in between my placements. I worked at the Grand Hyatt in Melbourne, and then I went back to India, Calcutta, which is home for me, um, and I worked at the Taj in Calcutta. Um, after graduation, one of our ex-students at the, at the school gave me a job at, uh, in Orlando at the Marriott there. Um, so in, in the US, I guess businesses work a little differently. You work for the franchise owner and manager of the hotel, and then you work under a brand. Um, so I worked two years in Orlando, went to Maine, um, up in a small little town called Bar Harbor for six months, came back to Miami, most of it all in hotel operations. Um, and then in 2001, 9-11 happened and the whole concept of revenue management, pricing, distribution came online with the likes of ExpedientHotels.com, two completely separate companies then, um, starting up um, with literally with startups and having nothing, coming, coming door to door, asking for inventory and trying to sell um, hotel rooms online um, and my VP of distribution then or whatever was distribution then said oh I think you'd really enjoy revenue management and that's how I started um, obviously having a strong operations background I've done housekeeping front office uh, food and beverage um, I, I was able to pick up the revenue management side but it was really an interest as well I did a few Cornell courses to get myself a better understanding and then I moved on to going to New York and I worked there for four and a half years for a company called Highgate under the brands of Hilton, Crown Plaza, and Radisson, looking after revenue management for all their hotels there. Um, came back to Australia in 2008, no, 2007, and I worked for a core for a year and a half and then got the opportunity at TFE Hotels, um, which is under Adina, Travelodge, Medina, Vibe, and now Rendezvous Hotels, to start their revenue management program because they didn't actually have um, a structured revenue management um, strategy in their business. Um, so started that and I've been with them for seven years. I now head up the sales, distribution and revenue teams at the company and I've been there for almost seven years now. On a day-to-day -day basis, what would you be your biggest challenge? I Bonus. think... <laughs> 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 I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> um, it's, it's about balancing my responsibilities. So I took, I took on the, re uh, the sales role about two years ago. Um, and, and while that's been challenging, that, that part of our business has changed so much, and, and you would know from an owner's perspective because you're paying out commissions, um, that part of our business has changed so much where you used to have traditional salespeople on property um, selling multiple hotels at a time, and now you're moving more and more online. So almost 40% of business in most hotels is now online, whether it's coming from their own website, um, but that's becoming more of a challenge, understanding the changing distribution landscape. Every day a new company <coughs> is coming up and opening up, and it's about balancing that and understanding what works and what doesn't work for your business. Harold, yep. if you could tell us a bit about uh, your company and what you're up to. Yeah, uh, look, Denwell Group is a diversified property group. We do we own commercial property, which is our uh, was our chief investment and still is our chief investment pursuit uh, and we have uh, we do residential development for resale uh, and we do hospitality uh, hotels we sort of got into the last category by accident uh, in the early <laughs> 2000s 
Um, and, and really it was because they, we, <coughs> from, from our point of view, um, hotels compete with other, with, other, uh, source, with other equity resources which we want to, uh, which we want to place. So it really has to wash its own face. It's not, we're not into hotels for the, for the hell of being into hotels. So it's, although it's a favorite of mine, I really have to uh, actively um, initiate why it's a good investment decision. Uh, so um, it, my, I do have, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll fill you in on that. Uh, I was a cons in South Africa, we had conscription, so we had uh, two years with the army service. And during that period, I uh, volunteered to be a chef. So that's the extent of my hospitality background. So in, in terms of revenue management, um, you know, I, I really don't know as much as you do, but I've, I've, been, I've been in the kitchen for a couple of years. So uh, when it, whenever I go into, when, whenever we, as investors, they, they take you into hotels, they sort of sideswipe past the kitchen because who's going to be interested in that? And I always sort of deviate, go into the kitchen and have a word with a chef and, and afterwards, we always, yeah, oh, they went to find out with the chef, what does he really want to know? You know, so we're, 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 uh, we're, we're hands-on asset managers. We get very involved with our operators in supporting them. Um, um, and in selecting our operator, there's a whole process that we go through. So um, I'm sure that we'll ask about those kinds of things later. But we're part of a, a, a bigger property group. And, um, you know, hotels are we think a really good investment, uh, you know, for, for 30 years in Australia, up to about 2005, uh, hotels were really um, seen as a, a really underperforming asset class. But now their time has arrived, and unfortunately, there are not as many Australian owners of hotels anymore, but uh, we're certainly one of those. Yes, I mean, I think it's one of the things that's changed the most. The, the owners of hotels have really got smarter in the last 25 years. Yeah. Um, you've got uh, hotels with the core and ridges. Yeah. Can you tell us without any trade secrets how, how you select which brand you're going to put on your hotels? Sure, so um, we, we go through a process um, and uh, you know, for instance, when we opened the Ridges Sydney International Airport Hotel, we'd gone through and through an international search process. We had 13 expre strong expressions of interest from local and, uh, and overseas based uh, operators. Um, and uh, when, we, when, we, when we decided who we were gonna choose, we looked at a number of, uh, of factors. Number one, it goes without saying that they have to have the, the corporate responsibility thing uh, outlined. You know, you, you have to be able to, uh, hotels are notor notoriously inefficient from a a resource point of view in terms of the amount of electricity and water they need to use. And it's, it's inevitable, you know, when, when someone arrives in a hotel, um, they, you know, they want to use, they want to put on the TV, they want to use the air conditioning, they want to have a shower, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's very high in resources. So the, the operator has to be cognizant of that. The oper operator has to have occupational health and safety. Fire life safety is very key in, in a, in, for any hotel. In Australia, we, we're lucky that we have the building, the building Code of Australia, which, is, which basically would supersede most American style of, um, you know, f uh, fire life safety uh, uh, um, requirements. So those kinds of things go with, without saying. Then there's actual, the, in, in no order of importance, it's in terms of competitiveness of, uh, of the bid. In, in other words, what kind of commission structure and overhead charges they want to, they want to, uh, they want to charge us accessibility to management and top management of the, of the operating group, um, and also the understanding of um, the, the industry in, in our particular circumstance. So if it's an airport hotel, there's a lot, there's a lot to know about the airline industry, and you know, uh, having, having a knowledge of that is important. Uh, so that's the, that's the kind of uh, things we went through. And I've got to say that, um, most of the overseas-based organizations, with some exceptions, uh, um, just don't get it uh, on how we operate in Australia. And a lot of them are, are, are based in Singapore or China. Even though they might sort of be European or American-owned, their, their, their local base is in Hong Kong or, 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 or in Singapore. And um, 
they have a much higher fee structure, they don't understand our high wages. And so uh, people like TFE and Accor, um, who, who have a very strong presence here, uh, Intercontinental, <laughs> Ridges, Mantra, uh, and a few others are, are really uh, by default lead the way in Australia as far as we're concerned in management. Now, if all you want is a name, Perhaps, you know, there are a lot of people out there. They're really good operators. They have local presence. But sometimes um, the, the, the financial benefit to us isn't strong. So, you know, and, and in some cases, if, if you do want a really strong brand, like um, a Hilton or a Marriott or, you know, um, or some, of the, some of the others, like a Taj or, or some of those other brands, you're probably better off um, um, doing it under a franchise type arrangement where you can control the costs yourself. Okay. You were TFE, you've got several brands. When you take on a new property, how do you, what sort of process do you go through to decide whether it's going to be a travel lodge or a vibe or whatever you might choose? So for us, there's, there's quite a lot of considerations. Obviously, owner relationships is key because um, if, if the hotel hasn't been built, it's, it's much easier because you discuss with the owner your different options, uh, whether you want to sit in the four and a half star or three and a half star space, that's the space we operate in. Um, and you can work with the owner to design the asset to its optimal, depending on how much space you have. Does the owner want apartments versus do they want uh, hotel rooms? And basically you're calculating the value that you can return to the owner per square meter of space that you have in your building. Um, TFE have, we have our own development team and our own technical services team, which means that we can actually sit with an owner and completely reconfigure their building site to be the most efficient for a hotel in terms of space utilization. Um, because a lot of our services are head office based, the amount of space that they need to fit their team in, their back office all is much smaller than it would be in a normal traditional hotel where you have 50 people on property. Um, but the brand selection is also about location. What brand, so we do a lot of market research along with the owner um, to work out what brand would be most fitted. If there's already five apartment hotels in that area, why would we, we build a sixth one? We would probably go with a hotel brand um, to make that decision, but we do it quite, working quite closely with the owner. Okay. We've talked a lot about profit, and obviously that is the bottom line. What's the next consideration you make? I mean, obviously profit's number one, but Harold, what, is there another decision that might just sway you? It's a cultural issue. Um, you need to be able to get on with, with, your, with your manager and he, you need to understand what his requirements are. He needs to understand what your requirements are. And, um, you know, that, that's probably the most important aspect of it uh, because you're only a sum of the people, you know, you, you can be a big shiny brand, but uh, unless you actually have that connectivity uh, and you can work together with people, uh, you know, and it's, it's not all about financial. Sometimes, you know, as an owner, you, you have to make an investment even though there's no immediate payoff. You know, there's, there's for instance, uh, there's some decisions we make. Um, of you, you have a four or four and a half star hotel. Um, you can close down certain aspects of it but you need to have a look at it in, in and, and you might do okay out of it for a while, but you really need to have a look holistically about what a four and a half star hotel provides and what the expectation is. Because you might get away with it for a year, but after a while, TripAdvisor catches up with you. <laughs> and we all read the TripAdvisor, I've got to tell you. Our, uh, we don't know why, but our Ridges Sydney Airport Hotel um, gets more um, um, TripAdvisor comments than the whole of the, the rest of the competitive set that we're dealing, which is another five hotels. Um, and a lot of it might be because we're very uh, connectivity savvy. We have online booking. We have, um, uh, you know, um, so, so people that are sort of uh, social networked or, uh, or really connecting, have apps, all that kind of thing are able to use us quite easily and, and that might be why we get that kind of person staying at the hotel. So, um, you know, those are all the things that, that, that you're looking at. Um, that's the second most important fit is the cultural fit. Jay, I think it's a lot profit. about I think it's a lot about trust. 
you have as as an owner you have to trust that the managers of your business will think like an owner and do the best that there has to be done for the business um, and and in to give you an example um, at TFE none of the team that we work with none of them know who the owners are they don't it's the senior management that know this hotel is owned by this one or that hotel is owned by that one the actual team on the ground don't actually know who owns the asset that way everyone's equal and you treat everyone as if they're an equal partner in the business and it works it's about trust the owners have to feel confident if 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 you've made a mistake it's better to tell the owner i think um tell the owner up front and try to find a way to fix it as opposed to just try to hide it you've sort of covered it but um how does your you're very hands on you've said that so you have a very close relationship to your to your gms um how does that work with the with the with the managing com company they accept that and you tie that up before you start that to be honest um when we first got into um, hotels, and they were minimum service hotels, Ibises, or as they were then called Formula Ones, um, it was the, the, the management company that actually wanted to have the meetings. So that um, they took the view that uh, uh, a well-informed uh, client or, um, or owner is, is, is always going to be actually understand better what, what the implications of the business are and how the business works. So, so um, you know, when when we started dealing with ridges, it was the same situation, and I think um, I think the managers actually um, uh, actually enjoy the, the interaction. And um, as I said, you know, sometimes I suppose you get bad owners, just as you might get bad managers. But uh, we we've not had that experience thus far. Good. Um, you've talked about uh, you've. Starting new hotels from go to woe. Maybe I can ask you, Shazine, first of all. How do you decide on the? We've talked about well, what brand it's going to be. How do you decide on room configurations? Whether you have kings or, or, or suites, or how, what? So, what drives you to make that decision? And also the amount of food and beverage that you might have. So, as a business, before we embark on the journey, um, we obviously have to get a feasibility from the owner. So we have to present the owner feasibility that need sign off. For that to be done on our side, we do a whole lot of market research. Um, I mean, we're lucky, TFE, we pretty much have a hotel in every capital city around Australia. Um, we have good in-depth knowledge. We're well connected with our corporate accounts. Uh, we have partnerships with all the inbound and wholesale accounts. So at any point in time, we can um, use that information and use that knowledge to build, we build an entire market analysis. And then we decide what segment, so part of my job is to actually work out for the, before we present to an owner, what segments will actually fill their hotel. And those segments have d different characteristics. If we think it's going to be tour series, they're going to need twin share accommodation. If it's going to be families, they need apartments with extra space. So we work through that together. And I think I'm correct in saying, Harold, with the airport hotel, you've already had a reconfiguration of some rooms. Yes, that's right. Can you share with us why and uh, how? Or? Yeah, well, uh, to start with, um, uh, our manager, um, we talked about our configuration and, and actually what happened is we took out insurance. So instead of just getting king beds, we got king zip beds. So, uh, you know, times change, some t ups and downs, and so you have more people sharing rooms. And as it happens, we've got so many sports groups through that having uh, being able to split the king bed into two single beds was really important for us. Um, in terms of uh, our hotel, though, um, we, we had a whole lot of suites, um, and they were, they were being the last, um, the, the last rooms, as is probably usual, uh, being filled up. But we'd noticed that we had this room which we which was a, a like a, a very long room which we call we, we put two queen beds into and it was called our queen queen room and this room had was sort of booked out from 30 days before which you know we only had eight of these rooms but it just seemed rock really what's going on here and so we identified that there were a lot of families that were coming through the through through the airport and wanted uh, a reasonably priced accommodation rather than getting two rooms. So we took a whole lot of our suites, our sort of what we called our junior suites, and we, ch we changed them into uh, family style accommodation. Um, you know, still with, it, with a, with, you know, not wishing to reduce it to a motel look, 
we still kept the aesthetic of a, of a four-star hotel. But, you know, you, you're able to sleep uh, four people in what we loosely call a room that was sort of two, two spaces, uh, and even in some rooms, five people. So, uh, and that's been a, a huge success. And uh, as a revenue manager, you'd appreciate that, you know, being able to sign up people on uh, 300 to $350 uh, versus uh, you know, a normal room at maybe $220 is, was, was very revenue accretive for us. I mean, for us too, we, we change configuration depending on the needs. So um, and as, as an example, a lot of our new build Adinas, they have maybe five dedicated two bedrooms, and then the studios and the one bedrooms all interconnect. So when we have that family de demand over the weekends or during school holidays, they become a two bedroom or they break down into a studio and a one bedroom. Um, and, and you're right, what the analysis that has to be done is how often is that room actually sold at the price point that it's actually priced at, or the increment that it's actually priced at? And would you rather have your suite sold five times a year for $1,000, or have that as two separate rooms sold 80% of the time for $350 each time? Thank you. Food and beverage. Um, I know that's, uh, of course, it's your strong point, but, <laughs> but what sort of considerations go into the amount of food and beverage you put in the, into your various brands? Because they I mean they take up a lot of space. Again, for us, it's location. It really is about location and what the key drivers are. If you're in a city set, so, and, and brand, so the vibes, the rendezvous, they have to have their food and beverage. Um, in a lot of hotels, for, for some of our travel lodges that have full restaurants, we've made the decision over time to close down lunch and just leave the lunch space open for conferencing to have lunch in, but not hope, open it up as an outside restaurant because let's say the restaurant is on level one and it's not on the ground floor for anyone on the road to be able to see it. Um, it, it is a fine balance because the profitability of food and beverage is extremely different from the profitability of rooms. Um, as an owner, you would want rooms all the time, um, and food and beverage is looked at uh, as a facility. But if you get the conferencing piece right, and you can get about a 35 to 40% profitability on the conferencing side, that helps your food and beverage offering. So you can do your room service, you can do a breakfast and a possible dinner option as well. You've actually got a very good location at the airport for your food and beverage, haven't you? Excellent. Yeah. Look, uh, so uh, most of you would know as students and uh, hotel professionals that breakfast is the biggest meal. Well, at the airport it isn't, it's dinner. So uh, that was a, came as a huge surprise to us. But if you actually think about it, people arrive at six o'clock or whenever they arrive in the evening and uh, they're sort of locked into that. They've got a choice. They can go across the road to the international terminal and <laughs> this side of, of airside, if you like, or before you go through, there's not much of an offering. So whatever you're going to get at the hotel is a lot better. So, and we, are, we offer to a, a sort of a pub style dinner and, a, and a, uh, you know, a full a la carte type dinner. And so uh, we've had a lot of success with dinners. Uh, breakfasts uh, have been poor because uh, people are out by six, seven o'clock in the morning, so they don't want to hassle. So even opening at 5 a.m. Didn't, didn't bring a whole lot of people uh, into the restaurants. Having said that, it's still about 35, 40%, so that's not to be sneezed at. Um, on, the other, on the flip side completely is our Ibis budgets in which we only provide a cold breakfast, or you can heat the toast, but that's about it. <laughs> um, and so uh, that is a truly minimum service, rather not select service. We, uh, we're right at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of star ratings, but in the profitability, I would suggest that we're on the top of the totem pole when it comes to uh, budget hotels. So um, uh, Accor have probably got the space completely to themselves with the Ibis budget, which is the last remaining sort of chain of two-star hotels. Um, and when people arrive, they, they know what they're getting. I'm going to just change tack a little bit. You're both managing people and, and leaders in your area. Can you talk a, bit, a little bit about leadership and managing skills that you use to get your job done on a daily basis, Shai? Purely because of time, I don't have time to manage people as a micromanager. Um, I have to, I, I guess I've always taken the approach that the people, I've, the team that I've hired, have to be trusted to do the job that you're hiring them for. And you let them do the job. Um, I interfere when they want me to interfere, and we do because I have a pretty big, I have a sales team, a, market, uh, a revenue team, and a distribution 
and a centre reservation staying. Sorry, how many would that be in total, approximately? About 55 people. Um, so each team has obviously a, a director underneath that. But the way I work it is I have regular catch-ups with my team leaders and they just keep me updated on what I need to know and what they need help with. But it's their decision on how they run their business and then we share strategy together. So part of my, my job over the last two years has been to put revenue and sales under one big umbrella so that the direction is one, but sales does their thing and revenue does their thing. Uh, Howard? Um, well, you, I mean, you work with a group of uh, fellow owners and that, but... Yes, well, uh, if, if you're talking about the, the operators, um, it's very much, uh, we, we take a view that we're appointing the operator and even down to decisions of do we allow staff parking and that kind of thing, we say, look, prepare a budget at the beginning of the year and include that whatever way you want to run it in the budget. In the budget. Uh, yes, we do have input into the budget, but I can honestly say our input is marginal. Um, you know, there might be a suggestion that we spend more on marketing for, for as a defensive measure because the dinner opened up at the airport. <laughs> uh, there, or, or there might be a, um, um, that we think that too much money has been spent in a certain area. Uh, but th these, are, these are all things on the margin. Um, I suppose w when you appoint a manager, you have to trust in that person. Um, and it's a long relationship. Most, most management agreements are at least 10 years. I've got a question here from Amy. And what do you th think is the uh, social significance and the impact that it has on revenue management? Look, social media is not going away. So we, we look at it from the perspective of you collect the information, you take some of it at face value, but you also listen. So our marketing team does a lot of work in terms of responding. Every single one of our TripAdvisor reviews, for example, the hotel managers actually go in and actually respond to every single review. Um, bits and pieces of feedback that we've got from guests are, oh, I'm going to go and stay there, even though person A or B had a bad stay. The fact that the hotel manager took the effort to actually respond, and I know that yeah. the, the Ridges guys do that as well, um, the fact that the hotel manager responded means the hotel cares enough about their guests to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So it actually helps you. Um, there's, we, we use a survey tool called Revenate, which allows us to pull our feedback from all different sources, including the OTAs, so the Expedias and the Booking.coms, all into one section so the hotel manager can get a sentiment um, survey result. Um, with that comes STR, which is our competitive set data, and you actually link your own performance to your comp set in there, and you can see if your ADR actually gets improves with your guest service scores or not. Yeah, look, uh, I think <clears throat> with our hotels uh, in Darwin in, uh, and in Sydney, um, we've actually uh, uh, gone a long way in terms of social networks. So not only we we sort of receivers of social network and the discourse, we actually initiated. So uh, there's, we, we put a lot of YouTube videos out onto the internet, um, uh, you know, with topical interest. Um, the, the, the amazing power of the social network is demo, if I can just demonstrate how strong it is. What happened is at the airport, uh, they had a viewing deck for, for the general public. And, um, and the, the airport, I think for security reasons, decided that they had to close this viewing deck. But we have a small sort of uh, deck off our conferencing facility on the top floor. So they had, they, had, they had discussions with our manager. And the manager said, sure, people can use it as long as we don't have a conference on. And what happened was Sydney Airport told all their plane spotting, there's a whole plane spotting community out there, uh, that, you know, we were offering, um, you know, this, the ability for them to come and use, use our facilities. And within a week, we had 3,500 hits. Now, you know what that does to your Google ranking, just like this. So we found lots of ways with YouTube of doing a similar thing. So. Uh, you know, there'd, there'd be an a, a anecdote about um, the state of origin, for instance, uh, and that all helps with the, with the whole YouTube. Uh, uh, some of our, uh, our, manage, our managers are very savvy with it. Uh, when, when a quote goes out now for uh, conferencing, um, there's actually, uh, the quote is actually, um, a, camera, a camera shot is actually taken of the person saying, hi, my name's Nikki. Uh, please find attached our quote. Uh, we, we welcome you at the, at, and that's done for a specific quote. 
It's actually photographed, uh, or some, a camera actually placed there. It's actually taken, it's not just a, an iPad camera, uh, um, iPhone camera. And so that whole connectivity, you're actually seeing the person presenting it. These are all things that are being adopted by, um, you know, hotels worldwide, and especially the savvier ones. Some of the, the older guys uh, who, who are sort of set in their ways uh, will find that they just don't compete. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just the smallest thing mm -hmm. that Absolutely. makes the biggest difference. Yeah. The, the uh, world is about connections now. So ev everyone wants to know who they're interacting yeah. with and who they're talking to. We put live chat on our 15 minutes. We got about 4,000 hits without even being ready for it, yeah. right? Because people just wanted to chat with someone. You, you mentioned earlier on uh, about the number of hits you get, uh, uh, Harold. Do, do you as an owner look at them regularly or do you leave that to your manager or their uh, team? We, as part of, you know, when I'm preparing for, for our monthly management meetings, I have a look at what uh, people are complaining about. There, there are a lot of, uh, you get a lot of complaints and you have to realise that um, what happens is that there are certain type of people that never give you compliments and are always very quick to complain. So uh, we get a ratio of 80 positive against 20% negative. That's pretty good. Um, you know, um, we, we try for 85% uh, rating on, 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 uh, on TripAdvisor. But we have a real issue is actually, actually responding to them. They act, our managers respond at Sydney Airport to everybody. But we get 160 actual uh, communications a week from from our guests, which is uh, astronomical. Full time really. job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fast becoming full time yeah. job. Yeah. And who'll go? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can just talk a little bit into the future. Where do you? We've, you know, putting your finger in the air 20 years ago to work out what your room rates would be to yield management to revenue management. Where's the, where's the next move in your? I think, I think pretty much everything is moving to dynamic. Um, so even your, I think in the next two to three years, wholesale and inbound business as well um, in its traditional model. And while they, they're both living side by side together right now, eventually it's all going to move towards dynamic and you're not going to sit and fill out pages and pages of contracts. Um, we've had some corporate resistance, but I think corporates too, with the likes of what Expedia and Booking.com are doing in terms of selling on to corporates. The corporates are getting more used to the concept of having dynamic pricing as well and more willing to take that dynamic pricing from hotels. Um, I, I think eventually contracts will mean nothing and it'll all, it'll all be dynamic. Can you just explain just a little bit more about dynamic? Sure. Dyna basically, dynamic pricing is the price point that the revenue managers or the hotel managers decide to, to put on for a particular day, sometime in the future, um, depending on the demand. So that, that, that could be, um, if, if I know, for example, it's Sydney, it's winter, um, it's a Sunday night, my rate might be 150, but I know there's an event happening on the Saturday, City to Surf on Saturday, I can charge 350. So part of a revenue manager's job is understanding all those demand drivers, both up and down. So you have to plan for your soft periods as well, and you choose to change your price point sometimes. Like at the airports, we can change our price point six, seven times a day for that day, depending on flight cancellations, changes in patterns of flights, um, Qantas calling and saying, oh, there's been a you know, <laughs> technical problem, no end, no, no pilot to take the plane anywhere, we've got to send everyone back to you. And how it's rung up to say there's a bomb on a flight so that gets cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing. I was telling Harold earlier that the Adina, which we just opened a few months ago, has been full pretty much since the day it opened. And we're sharing the love. <laughs> <laughs> so did, where do you see it moving? Uh, have you got any oh, view look, on that? It's, it's, we just accept we're in a, um, we don't even understand uh, anymore uh, the, the old models, so to speak. We understand that's what our managers have to deal with. But when we're doing feasibilities, and remember, initially we'll do a feasibility without having a, uh, an operator on board. Uh, we, we're just saying, well, what rate is there going to be out in the market there? And, um, you know, there's, they're different, obviously, wholesales, but even that's becoming dynamic. You know, you'll say, this period is that. Uh, you know, if you, if, you want a, if you want a lead time of 30 days, forget it. You have to give us 90 days time. Um, 
So, you know, um, even, even to the extent now that uh, I'm glad that we're actually managing to fill the Adena with, uh, with all the disrupt business because I was wondering where they were going because <laughs> we actually, we, 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 actually, we, actually <laughs> we actually put up our prices. So, so we didn't get many people last year. But um, so, you know, uh, disrupts, by the way, are a really important part of, of, of the airport community, the airport hotel community. Uh, there's a lot of disrupts, and it, it's not just flight delayed, you know, that people are going to miss a connection. Uh, there's, it comes in many different forms. And also, I have to tell you, if there's fog in the morning in Sydney, there's going to be a disrupt by the end of the day. That's a given, right, unfortunately. Um, we don't actually have a certain, it's, it's interesting, like uh, in parts of Europe, they've actually got uh, landing systems which allow people to la land in any kind of weather. We actually don't have that in Sydney. Uh, it would cost quite a lot of money, apparently, to, to allow it, something like $150 million. But uh, we don't have it. And so on those days, we know things are going to be uh, really tough. I read something this morning about the middlemen, so to speak, taking too much out of the pot. Is that a problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, is, and how's that going? To, when we talk about the middlemen, we talk about when they pass the rooms on, obviously somebody takes a commission and that commission's getting bigger and you're getting less and the owner's certainly getting less. So, I mean, what's happened over the last... So, over the last five years, there's two different types of disruption, if you want to call it, I think. So, one is the fact that people are not calling the hotels anymore. So, most hotel companies, I think, see a huge drop in call volume and a lot of online business increase. Part two of that is also that a lot of the online travel agents, so the Expedia, What If, or What If doesn't exist anymore, but all that used to exist, have all consolidated in the last year. So where you used to have 10 potential players, you now pretty much have Expedia and you've got Priceline. So Priceline owns Booking.com, Agoda, um, Priceline, and they've bought a few other smaller companies. Um, and that's, that's led to commission increases for most of the businesses. It, again, depends how well you negotiate. Um, how big a partner you are with them, um, rules can be better. In general, commissions have gone up. Um, and I think the third thing is meta search companies that have come into the market. So um, TripAdvisor is a, is a perfect example. TripAdvisor used to pull um, rates from Expedia, Booking.com, Hotels.com, and Display, and then you as a customer could choose wherever you wanted to book. TripAdvisor now allows and, and so they would get a part of that commission from Expedia. TripAdvisor now allows you as a hotelier to book direct or to flat, have your own price point, your own website, which is the cheapest channel of distribution, um, and commission directly from you. So that's actually bringing down and balancing it all off. So you're no longer, and it, depending on the company and the philosophy that you have within your business, if you, if you spread your wings and work with multiple partners as opposed to just limiting yourself to one or two, then you have that ability to flex your commission levels and make sure that you continue to give your owners the best return. What we find, though, is we measure our returns based on net revpa and net profit. So we look at the cost of distribution of every channel. We look at the commission that we pay, as well as any booking fees that might be incurred, and we report back to our owners on market segments that are generating based on their cost structure. So who's giving us the highest net average rates and who's giving us the highest net revpa? Do you comment on that as an owner? Yeah, look, uh, it's <coughs> I don't know how many uh, internet-based people there are, yeah, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, you know, in America, they have commission ratings of 20 to 25 percent. Eventually, we'll land up there as well. And, um, you know, they don't provide a hotel. They just, you know, Bookings.com spend $1.5 billion a year on online advertising and search and whatever else Google, mainly Google, can, 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 can provide it. And um, to the extent that the Bookings.com people actually sit inside uh, Google's headquarters, so I'm sure they know the minute that those, uh, what do those call those things where, where you find out how, how, how to search, the, and it doesn't take you like go and search for any hotel in Sydney or elsewhere. I can bet your bottom dollar that bookings.com comes up first. So um, 
it's, it's frustrating on the one hand, although on the other hand, it does allow you a delivery system. And I'll give you an example. We have a, a block of 11 apartments that are on the beach in Bondi. So um, we decided that we we're gonna, uh, we'd manage them ourselves. There are only 11 of them. Um, and for us, that's been a, that's been a, a saving grace because you know, online, um, not our own websites, account for 70% of our business. Um, and, um, you know, so they, they, port, they form a very important function. Certainly for minimum service hotels, they're vital. Uh, you know, you said 40% of your business comes on, uh, from online sources. Well, at the minimum service hotels, it's 75 to 80. So, um, you know, um, it becomes very much more commoditized the lower down the, uh, the, the, the ranking you're going. So uh, my, my view is, is that at some stage, um, um, they'll go one step too far, the booking engines, and what, they, what they'll be doing is anti-competitive. But in the meantime, it's, it's a, something that we have to live with. All right. And if, I'm just going to ask another question. I'd like, in a moment, I'm going to throw the uh, questioning open to the audience. So we've had a lot of information here today. I'm sure it's been very, very interesting and should promote, I hope, some questions from you, the audience. So if you could just prepare your question. Um, this is from uh, Lewis in uh, Sydney. Do hotel discounts and promotions make a positive difference? So I think what we're saying is that you, you're giving something away, but is there a positive in it? Well, I suppose the, the answer is we wouldn't do it consistently if there wasn't some positiveness. But I've got to tell you, just throwing out an email with a discount sometimes just doesn't do it. Um, you know, um, so uh, what a lot of that actually does is, is just give you more brand awareness, make a hotel out there known. But I think you've got the expert here who could probably give you more information on that. And I'm taking notes. <laughs> I think from the perspective of you have to, you have to really understand where and why you're using that discount. If you are marketing that discount in a market that wouldn't normally come to your hotel, a 20% off might get them to come and stay. Um, in the Australian market where almost 80% of our business is domestic, going with a 20% off at, at any year round is never ever going to work. So it's about really understanding who is um, who needs that discount and doing it as a target. A lot of customers want value now. So instead of a discount in price, they would rather have a buy one, get one free breakfast if they're coming back for the fifth time or sixth time, or they'd like to have a dinner um, as opposed to just a price difference. So it's about understanding your customer and then catering to what their needs are. Okay, do we have any question from the audience? Yes, Suji. Uh. Uh, uh, hello, um, my name is Sujin. Um, we talked about a lot of important things, but I just want to know as an alumni, what were your key like attributes that made you so pro like professionally successful in the revenue management? And also as a CEO, what do you look for like in revenue? Like as, if you're hiring a new revenue manager, what do you want them to be like? What do you, how do you want them to work and what kind of thinking skills you want them to have? A big question. <laughs> <laughs> it is a really good question. Yes. Um, but I suppose revenue management comes in different, uh, in different parts, right? Um, so if you've got a straight revenue manager who's going to sit in his office the whole day, and let me tell you, stats, there are some people that love that stuff, right? If they're going to be, they're going to be statistically orientated. They're going to understand the industry backwards and forwards. Um, and I think what, besides statistically, you have to be holistically and you'd be able to answer this. You have to understand what drives people into a hotel. So it takes a deep understanding of the industry. So a statistician, you can be the smartest statistician around. Um, it's not, you, you're not, it's not going to give you that intuitiveness that you need. So uh, I think it's being an all-rounder, starting off that way, understanding the industry, and then focusing on, 
on revenue management uh, and, and, and what, makes, what drives revenue management, how to basically load the hotel. You know, because the, the airlines have been doing it for years. Um, you know, we sort of came into it later in the, in the 90s. I mean, as, as a revenue manager, you can be brilliant at the numbers. Mm -hmm. If you can't sell your strategy to the business, forget about it. Um, it, it really is about, and every single revenue manager in my team, I insist, has a hospitality background. It's completely different to sitting at a desk and doing business analysis in a different industry because there's people involved, there's guests involved. You have to, the sales, there's marketing. Basically, as a revenue manager, you're standing up there selling to your GM as well as everyone else on your team, this is the strategy for the business. If you don't have the skill set to be able to sell that, you're never going to win. Thanks. Did you have a question, Henning? Um, what was the career path tactic that um, achieving like similar uh, career that you've been passing through? I, I, I mean, I think, like I started, I, I've done food and beverage, I've done housekeeping, I've done reservations manager, front office manager. Uh, a great start is if you can get into a company that gives you a management training program, because that allows you to be at one hotel or within one company and do pretty much every department. Um, you need some amount of finance knowledge and you have to be naturally enjoying that piece of it because there's a lot of revenue management there. Uh, in terms of understanding profitability and, and the importance of the decisions. But more than anything, you have to want to learn. So in revenue and distribution, and I've, I've been in it pretty much since 2001, literally it's changed hugely from what the revenue manager used to do, which was log into the back end of Hotels.com and load rates every day, to now designing the entire distribution strategy of a business or a company. So it, it's all about self-teaching and learning yourself. So I. I talk to a lot of people. I still do Cornell courses online. Um, I uh, attend trade shows, conferences, things like that to learn myself. So networking will be a big part of it as well? Yes. Okay. Sharing ideas and revenue managers are actually good. It's probably sharing. not one for you, Harold, unless you want to pass a comment? Yeah, I'll pass on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, two questions. First, uh, for a new hotel that starts from zero, how is the revenue management process that you have to have, like to settle like all the conditions, uh, promotion and that? Uh, well, let's deal with that one, and then we'll go to the second one, if that's okay. So you're opening a hotel up. There's no history. Where do you start? Uh, start with your market research um, and looking at the competition. Um, I guess with rate transparency, you can see pretty much everything that everyone is selling at now. Um, there's a lot of detailed analysis we do in terms of the competitive set. We determine who the competitive set is going to be. So there's, there's a company called Smith Travel Research, um, STR, that does this globally. Um, they collect competitive set data from hotels worldwide and they create what's called a trend report. So you understand from that the history of the hotels around where you're sitting. Um, and then you set some benchmarks and then you start researching Talk to your clients, find out what the corporate rate expectation is, what the wholesale inbound demand is, and what that rate is expectation is, and then you build up an entire plan. So there's almost about six, seven months of revenue management work prior to a hotel's doors actually opening. Can I just ask a question there? How soon do you press the panic button after you've opened? Don't panic. I don't. <laughs> okay. You can't panic. I don't That's think all right. you can. Uh, we, we've got a, a... You can keep amending your strategy till you find that middle point that, that's correct. But if you panic too soon, you've pretty much trashed all mm. your business decisions without even letting it... You have to give a hotel six to eight months to ramp up, depending on its location. And we were saying for Adina Airport, for example, we were full... There's the no ramp up. We, there's no ramp up. Support. We were full the next day. We were full the next day. We had to put people with without curtains in some of the rooms. But good operators okay. and good owners, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> an, owner, an owner would expect a much faster ramp up. Uh, can I just uh, yes, add certainly. to that, is that uh, we're busy building the Regis Brisbane Fortitude Valley Hotel at the moment, and yeah. the first appointment, um, even before general manager, has been the revenue manager, who's been on there nine months before. 
and she's busy building rates and she's building <coughs> uh, a model of, of how, how it's going to look. So it's, it's vital and, and all, the, all the good operators know that. And I think so, that... And, and, and in terms of ramp up, you expect three years uh, to ramp up. So if you start off and you're 25% occupants in your, full in your first month, I actually don't think that that's even a panic button. You actually need to feel that you're doing something wrong. Um, so by your third year, you want to sort of be around where you should be. And, and really, to get really well known, it takes five years. Um, obviously, there, there's some markets that are a little bit different. Uh, places where at the airport where there's, a, there's really an urgent driver, are always, it's always useful to have. But um, other, other than that, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard slog to get known. And whether, you know, the, the online world makes it easier, but it's still, it's still a bit of a, it's a, it's a hard slog. Interesting. I mean, probably five to ten years ago, you'd have had your general manager and operations manager on site, and somebody in finance would have been coming in, to, you know, close to, the, close to opening up. So there's a major difference in the way hotels are, have started up and operating now. Your second question, please. Thank you. And the second question is uh, for New Year's Eve. That is like one of the highest seasons. What are like the like the policies that you have, like minimum stay, blackout days with OTAs and that, or that dates? So how, how do we set them? Yes. Um, again, a lot of historical information as well as forward. So um, TFE, we use a revenue management system mm -hmm. within across our entire business, which gives us forecast for forward holdings as well, looking at our pickup trends, uh, which, which kind of indicates to us whether our New Year's Eve, for example, let me just talk about Sydney, for example, whether New Year's Eve is going to be as strong as the previous year or going to be stronger. And then we tweak depending on the days of the week, depending on when, like if you look at two years ago, New Year's Eve was much bigger than it was last year because the ashes and New Year's Eve kind of overlapped. So you had lots of international visitors. But if you're just depending on the domestic market, then it's slightly softer, but it's still it's still four five hundred dollars a night with a three or four night minimum stay, and, and, we, and we would do that for all events across the country, across New Zealand, wherever we have hotels. And a lot more on a high rise overlooking the harbour. Absolutely. <laughs> Not a, thank you, Yes, Carl. Thank you. Um, in the hospitality world, and as revenue managers. Uh, what would you say it would be the most important key efficiency, efficiency indicator? Would it be your rate efficiency, room, seller, or channel? Net ref par. So the net revenue that you get per room available that you've got in your hotel. So how we've always traditionally looked as, as revenue managers, because we don't control cost, as revenue managers we look at ref par as an indicator. Like globally we have ref par. Um, however, we now influence the channel of distribution, we influence the commission levels, we influence the cost of those channels, we ha hence we have to look at net REVPA. Thank you. Yeah, yeah look, um, REVPA, less, less your commission, is, that's, that's what it's all about. And uh, your costs are pretty much, um, uh, you know, y you can have a fair idea what they are. Some of them are variable, some of them are fixed. But um, we get an analysis every morning of every hotel that we own, and we can we meet the, the figure I look for is REVPAR. Um, uh, th then there's the, the commission rates are, are reasonably static from month to month, increasing unfortunately, but they're static. But uh, that's that's the number I look at. There's nothing else. I mean, there's interesting. there's no point in selling 45 percent of your business or 50 percent of your business on online if you're actually going to pay. 25% to get that business when your other channels may be only 5% or 6%. A question from our uh, Lura campus from Dr. Edmund Go. How would new competitors such as Airbnb affect revenue management pricing strategies of hotels or would they? So it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think, I think we've taken the approach that Airbnb is a distribution partner. Um, we work with Airbnb for our Adinas and our Medinas, and they sell beautifully at a very reasonable level of commission. And the, the way I'm seeing it is it's, it's almost a totally different market segment. It's not taking away from our corporate business. It's not taking away from our leisure business. It's, it's people who want the apartment-style product, which we're lucky enough to have, 
and we've been selling them very successfully. We're getting thousands of room nights from Airbnb. Okay. Um, I've got to say, we, we're not, um, I don't see us as a, a natural competitor for, in terms of uh, our hotel accommodation because people are looking for Airbnb are, are usually looking for apartment or a different alternative kind of stay. Um, we've been singularly unsuccessful, I have to tell you, in getting occupancy for our, our small block of service departments uh, through Airbnb. So that's interesting. Maybe we're doing something wrong there. Might have to have a chat afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a question from the whole class in, in, in Lura. Um, that sounds ominous. Mr. Yes, it does. <laughs> and you've sort of answered it, but what, what are the key attributes for a revenue manager? And then maybe I'll ask you, Harold, what, what you look for if, if you're you know, viewing a, a potential revenue manager. What do you think they are? I think true passion in terms of the hotel industry and really understanding what's driving your business. Um, a very, very thorough understanding of the distribution channels and opportunities. Some financial understanding. You don't have to be an Excel wizard, honestly. That's completely a misnomer. Well, I can do A and B, but that's, that's about it with Excel. Because you now have systems that can give you that information. So you should be able to click a button and get the information you need. But you need a skill set of being able to analyze that information. Um, and that, that takes a bit of practice. Um, and I think being able to sell your strategy. Okay, Harold. Uh, to be honest, we're not obviously um, in in finding a person. We we, we lean on our operators uh, a hell of a lot. So um, you know, um, it it just needs. It's such a exciting industry, the hospitality industry. It really is. I mean, I've been involved in all kinds of property, and this is definitely the most exciting part of it. You know, there's so much. It's so dynamic generally. So you want someone that shares that excitement. You know, that's for me is important. Okay, this is. I think we could stretch this question out a little bit. It's from Carl. Australia has, has been a country with a very diverse uh, culturally. How does culture diversity impact on revenue management? But slash building a hotel is is it a consideration? The diversity in Australia, or it's a non-event. Um. Look, in building hotels, we've actually, the, all, all, we actually have built all our hotels ourselves. Uh, so um, we, we garner advice from everybody, from hotel professionals, operators, um, you know, from our own experiences. And yes, uh, there, there are cultural issues. But I think um, I can be bold and say that Australian culture embraces everybody. It's an inclusive kind of culture. So. If you're just acting like an Australian, you're going to be okay. Ob obviously, uh, if you want uh, Japanese, a lot of Japanese visitors, you might need to have baths. Uh, if you, you know, um, if you're having a lot of Chinese visitors, perhaps you'll want to uh, have your menu um, in Mandarin. But you know, uh, those are just obvious things. You know, so I don't see. Um, um, the, the, we build hotels for Australians today. So even a four-star hotel. The days of having a 35 square meter room for four star hotel are over. Uh, they're 26 square meters. Um, and uh, that's what it is. And we build it for Australians. Australians understand that. You know, in some, some Asian localities, perhaps 26 square meters isn't, isn't good enough for a four star hotel. But that's what we can deliver in Australia. It's tough enough to make a hotel stack up. Um, uh, you know, you just have to save money where you can. TFE are the forefront of that, I've got to tell you, <laughs> genuinely. And the, the, their ability, because they're also hotel owners, the, they, they're almost unique today in the Australian context in that they're, Australian, they're owners and operators. A lot of the operators used to own hotels, they don't anymore. Uh, and so, you know, they, they know what it takes to make a hotel viable. And, you know, um, it's to their credit that they can deliver Adinas today, they can still deliver Adinas that are profitable because they're not just rooms, you know, they're, they're actually units. So, so there you go. Seen any? I think, I think cultural diversity is, is a great thing to have, actually, because you don't want to be stuck with only one segment. And I'm thinking as a revenue manager, I want to Tell be able to, uh, I want to be able to tap into different market segments coming into the country. And as long as, like if the hotel is built, it's much harder to change structurally anything that's required.
But honestly, people are coming to Australia for a different experience. Just because um, a Japanese tourist is coming here doesn't mean we have to cater to them the exact same hotel that they would get in Japan. They're coming here for a different experience. And if we sell it properly, 100%. which is what we, we should do as a sales team, sell it properly, it should be all good. Okay. So they should have a good experience. Question from the audience. Thank you. Um, so we're obviously talking about owners and managers. Does it ever happen that the strategy that the managers are thinking does not align with the owners because perhaps the owners are not thinking that far in the future? Yes. And if it does, how do you sort that out? Um, um, Good question. I've looked at uh, information memorandums of hotels and not Togo hotels, I'll, I'll say that immediately, where I don't understand, we, we run four-star hotels and, and minimum service hotels, and I look at the cost structure and I say, how did that happen? Honestly, you can see the revenue is right, but the costs are wrong, and they're wrong by a multiple of one and a half or two times. Now, that affects the value for, for the owner of the hotel. It affects the amount of money you can borrow against, uh, you know, developing a hotel. You know, um, traditionally, for an operating hotel, you don't get more than about 55% gearing. That means your debt is 55% of your total cost. And it affects all these kinds of things. And there are some operators that just can't manage things properly. Um, and they're the international operators that I spoke, to, spoke about previously, um, and honestly, um, that's the, why the, it's important to be able to, the, we understand that there's, 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 there might be a penalty to be able to get out of it, but you have to have that penalty because your, your operator might just not get it or might be rogue or might be something. So, How much consideration do you give as owners to the operation operational profits as opposed to what your investment might be worth in five to ten years time? Um, I've always taken the view that um, cash flow is key to everything. So um, uh, we're not collectors of hotels. Uh, when we decide to go ahead with a hotel, it has to be because it's better than a, than a commercial property investment, for instance. And um, so the attraction to us of hotels is cash flow. So our view is that if, unless you're producing the cash flow, that increase in value won't, will, be, will be illusionary. Yes, you might get a hotel collector who actually just wants the, the enjoyment of our owner hotel, but uh, that's, not, that's not how the world really works. And it's very, very rare in Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Every, everyone needs to make an income out of it. Although when you sell a hotel room for a million dollars <laughs> a, a room, I'm not sure what, how, how you make money out of that. Yes. Yes, thank you. With owning your buildings, why, what are your pros and cons to renting them out to the hotel? Well, um, today it's, it's very unusual to be able to lease to a hotel operating company. So a that was a traditional model but you find very few of these leases still in place today. There are a few. I know that the Holiday Inn at uh, Melbourne Airport is still run on that kind of basis, and um, I think there might be one or two travel lodges that are from a historical perspective. But uh, today you'll find the operators aren't keen to take, out, to take on that lease. Of the, so what actually happens is they're operating for us, so they're operating on our checkbook, and for that they get paid a percentage of turnover or a percentage of profit or both. Uh, and there might be other, uh, there other things as well. So we're not actually renting it out to, uh, to the operator. We're actually, uh, they are managing it for us. And do you find the hotels that you put into and the hotels Yes, uh, absolutely. It's really important, and that's that's what we do understand, and we focus on ourselves. Uh, we obviously ask advice from operators, but uh, for us, that's the key. That's what we bring to the party. We developers, 
with property developers. And for, uh, for us, um, you know, uh, important issues are air conditioning systems. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's really unsexy, but to decide whether we're going to put in an LG air conditioning system or a Dakin air conditioning system, it was, takes a really long time and a lot of research to find out. So uh, those kinds of things. And FF&E, uh, you want something contemporary. Uh, you want something that's, that's going to excite the public to stay at you. You want, you want, you, you want, to, you want that difference. You want to, you're always looking for that difference. Uh, and so that's, that's what we like to put into our hotels. Uh, um, you know, some of them, some hotels don't require uh, like uh, U-Buttes type of furniture. Uh, we, we have some hotels where the occupancy level is 1.1 days. So that's, that's the average stay. So they, they're just using it as utility. Uh, at other um, um, resorts, for instance, people are going to be there for you know, up to a week or 10 days. Uh, you have to provide a little bit more. So uh, it's important that, that whatever, whatever you do, you lay out the hotel really well so that it food and beverage really works well with the kitchens and the bar. Uh, you know, uh, if you've got multiple hotels, you want them serviced out of one kitchen. It's not always possible. But that's what you want to do. Plus, I think as an owner and a manager, you have a pretty strict CapEx approval process, right? Yeah. Because yeah. The, the, the people using the property every day can come up with what cap capital requirements are required for the next three to five years. We usually present it to the owners once a year during budget time and get a sign off on them. Question from me. There's a lot of outsourcing going, or always has gone on, particularly in housekeeping. But I hear some companies now are outsourcing accounting and all sorts of things. Do you see that as, as growing or, or, or shrinking? Growing, I think. And it's, it's more to do with the cost of labor in Australia. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it doesn't stack up when you look at how much cheaper it is to outsource versus keeping the people in-house. But you really have to decide if you're outsourcing, if it's data processing or things like that, if it's an accounting, if it's data processing and you go, you have to follow A to Z, and these are the 10 steps, that's fine. But if it's anything that needs more analysis, it's very difficult to outsource but manage from here. And you need to keep control, obviously. Absolutely. You'd otherwise Absolutely. lose control. As an owner, what do you think about outsourcing? Um, you know, we'd be open to it, but um, the only things we outsource at the moment are housekeeping. Uh, I suppose linen is a form of outsourcing. People used to have their own laundries. Some hotels still do, but that's... And no new hotels will, will, will have laundries in the future. Audience. Thank you. I'd like to know uh, how is like the interaction between sales, revenue management, and marketing, and who leads, and how are the conditions? Because I've seen that in some hotels, like the sales and revenue have maybe it's like a little tension about the rates that are like high and like. Um, it, it, it's a challenging one, and every company has a, has a different philosophy on who reports to who. Um, my true belief, after being doing revenue management for almost 15 years now, is revenue, sales, and marketing should all report to the director of uh, to the to the general manager, so that the GM, this is at a hotel level, the GM makes the overarching decision on which way the strategy fits. So in my job, that's my, my job now is to put, and it's different for TFE because our marketing is more about brand marketing and our website. So I work very closely with the marketing team, but the marketing team don't report into me, but they do all the, the branding uh, work. In, in our case, the sales and the revenue team, they both report into me, but I allow the sales and the revenue teams to actually fight and argue and do group displacements to see whether they should or should not take a piece of business. Revenue managers um, always want the best in terms of financials for the hotel. The salespeople often know if we lose this piece of business, we're not going to get it back for the next three years after that because it would have gone to a competitor. How would those following three years impact? And if you've got a good revenue management system in place, the revenue manager, the salesperson, they usually work it out together. They reach either a compromise that's best for the business or they pretty much come to me and I'll make that compromise decision, whatever it might be. Um, but but they, have to work. they have to argue, they have to hash it out between them and then make the best decision for the business. Can you comment? I think it's okay. Okay. All right. Um, what is it, uh, Harold, what is it you most enjoy about being involved 
we a diverse uh, portfolio, but what is it you most enjoy about your involvement in hospitality? I think it's the dynamic nature of it. It's the enthusiastic people that work in the industry and um, uh, the change, right? You know, uh, when you're collecting rent, nothing much changes. You know? <laughs> uh, when you're developing, I mean, it has its exciting points there, different phases of development. Uh, but um, I think uh, with, with hotels, there's always a dynamic, interesting story happening. I mean, everybody's got their favorite hotel story. We don't get that in property, you know. We don't get that collecting rent. So I think it's a dynamism of the, of the, of the industry. It's also the, what I call value-added property, and that's why we're into it. You know, there are quite a few areas of value-add property around. Um, uh, you know, you might be into uh, self-storage. Um, you might be, you know, it's, it's for us, it's a way of adding value to just a normal property. So that's, that's what I really enjoy. You've been at it for a long time now. What keeps you going? I think for me, it's the people, the interaction. Um, every day Young is different. Young she's at it for a long time. In Honestly, terms of in terms hurts. in terms of our audience, Students, in okay. terms of our audience, I, I might add. He's young. I as mean, a, as like, a student, I'm an old yeah, okay. egg. <laughs> okay. Is what he's telling me. Okay. Uh, um, it, it's the people and it's the interaction and the learning because, as Harold said, it's so dynamic. You have to keep abreast with what's going on. Um, and, and you're learning every day and every guest interaction and situation and in my case a client interaction and situation is completely different. So I have a story for every day. Okay. What do you see as the future uh, uh, the uh, occupation, uh, accommodation in uh, business in Australia? Uh, I think in the immediate future it's very bright. Uh, if you think that we're actually going through a bit of a downturn at the moment, um, the hotel industry is performing very well in this downturn. Um, and um, especially in Sydney, I can only see things getting better. There's really constrained supplier um, and, you know, um, especially in the CBD, we, I, I reckon we could absorb three, 4,000 rooms like that, no problem. Um, um, as can seen by the development that's actually taking place or planned outside of the, the CBD core area. So I think for, for, uh, for, for Australia and Sydney in particular, um, the hospitality outlook is bright. Um, we've seen a lower dollar, which has led to a double whammy, really, because foreign, foreign visitors, it's cheaper. And for local visitors, it's cheaper than now going offshore, where we lost a lot of uh, that visitation before. Um, I agree with Harold because our, our leisure numbers are up 20-30% um, year on year. We've also seen, uh, and, and because it's, we sit in diverse markets around Australia, as long as you've got more than one key driver in a market, those markets are doing really well. Sydney, Melbourne, um, Brisbane has an oversupply right now, but over the next two years that supply will balance off with demand starting to increase back up. Um, and similar to Perth, Perth had an extraordinary boom over over the resource construction phase, and now it's basically stabilizing. But it's still not bad. I mean, the city still runs at 85% occupancy. Um, I think the opportunity for Australia is rate growth. If we can, as a city, Sydney runs at 88% occupancy year round, um, very similar to New York and London, and our rates are probably half the price that they should be. And they're, not, and they're actually only modest increases that we've been seeing in Rev Park on an annualised basis. So if these 3,000 rooms came along in the next little bit, how, how badly would that affect it? Well, they won't come along because they don't stack up at the moment. It's as simple as that. Um, so you need the rate growth to actually... Um, I mean, you've got 2,000 rooms coming into Sydney in the next two years with the convention centre, but then the positive outlook of the convention centre um, is going to enhance that because you'll have enough demand created and, and based on our discussions with BE Sydney we know that they're holding really well for the next three years um, and lots of big conventions coming back to Sydney which will be great. I might add that as a graduate of the schools driving that. <laughs> um, so advice, if you could give some uh, advice for a potential manager for the future what would it be? have to enjoy and love no, I'm what not, you do. I'm not talking, sorry, I'm not just talking about revenue, I'm just no, talking no. about you. Yeah. You have to, in hospitality, you have to love and enjoy what you do. It's a tough, it's a tough industry. Um, 
It's long hours, the demands are a lot, and it's always changing. But if you are truly passionate about the, the industry, you'll, you'll succeed. No. Um, yeah, it's, it's all about the passion. Um, to be honest, um, I don't know why it is, but the industry aren't as good payers as some other industries. Um, but um, I'm sure that's, th that's about to change as well. So uh, uh, if, I, if I was living my life again, uh, I would love to have gone to, to Wharton or, or one of the business schools you talked about in the States and, and done hotel management. But uh, I'm a chartered accountant by profession, so I've sort of come in that devious route. Chef and account an accountant. <laughs> dangerous combination. <laughs> Very dangerous. <laughs> We're going to, uh, if there's any more questions from the audience, it's your last chance. You won't get many opportunities like this. All right. So what I might do is thank Harold and Shazine very much. <laughs> Cer certainly, I've uh, certainly I've learned a couple of things, and uh, hopefully you've all much better insight into management, where owners, how owners think, how people who work for owners think, and how, how different companies uh, go about managing their operations. So on my behalf, thank you very much to both of you. Thank you for having us.